I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 22nd, 2014, I'm interviewing Dr. George Bray for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at McCormick Place, Chicago. George, would you tell me a little bit about your family background? Uh, my family came from the Midwest. We lived in Illinois, uh, just north of Chicago. My father and his family were from Wisconsin, and my mother and her family from, were from Arkansas. My grandfather on my mother's side uh, went to the University of Arkansas. Uh, his name is on the walkway they have there where, uh, in the class of 1893 when he graduated along with seven others from the university. Um, then his uh, daughter was my mother, and they got married in Chicago, and I was born in Evanston, Illinois, and raised uh, on the North Shore of Chicago until I went away to school. Uh, what did your mother and father do for a living? Uh, my mother was a teacher, and my father worked for the Illinois Bell Telephone Company after a couple of jobs prior to that after getting his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And what was it like growing up in Chicago, I guess during the end of the Depression and uh, during World War II? Well, it was, it was a lovely place to grow up. It was a community, um, a suburban community on the north shore of Chicago. We had access to the lake, so we could go swimming in the summer. We had an outstandingly good school system. Uh, when in our high school, uh, more than 90% of the graduates went on to some form of advanced education. So it was primarily a university prep school, Nutra Township High School. Did any of your teachers have a particularly strong influence on you? Uh, I think they all did. Uh, I, had, I had an interest in literally everything we did, biology, chemistry, physics. I took four years of French, uh, English, uh, uh, mainly college preparatory subjects, and I liked all of them. When did you commit to a medical career? How'd that come about? I'm not, I'm not quite sure how I became interested in medicine, but, but I know I did uh, because when I got around to selecting colleges, uh, my interest in medicine was there and actually swayed some of those discussions. So let, let me just tell you about my admission to school, yeah. college. Um, at the end of high school, um, we were thinking about where I should go and I applied to six different schools, University of Michigan, Trinity College, uh, Stanford, Harvard, uh, Brown, and Northwestern. Northwestern was close by, Michigan wasn't far away. Uh, three of them gave me scholarships, Stanford, Harvard, and Brown, and I decided uh, that Stanford was too far away. This was in the days when almost everything was still by train. You could fly, but it was expensive and, and we couldn't have afforded it. Uh, so that left me with two schools that had given me scholarships, and to make a decision, I went into the dean of the high school and said, I was thinking about medicine and I might want to go to Harvard, uh, but I'd been accepted to Brown and Harvard as an undergraduate. And he said, well, you don't want to spend eight years in Boston, do you? And so I ended up picking Brown. Okay. And did you meet your future wife at this time? Uh, yes, and one of the nice things about having gone to Brown was that I met my current wife in the freshman dance in 1949, um, and we uh, dated for a year and a quarter. Uh, we wrote letters to one another over that period of time, and then she told me she preferred somebody else. <laughs> so it wasn't until our 25th reunion that we were both there and saw each other across a crowded room, and the rest is history. So. You met her 25 years later, is that what you said? Uh, at the 25th reunion. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. What's her name and what was her career? Um, my wife's name is Marilyn uh, Mitzi for short. That's what she's been called ever since uh, I've known her. Um, she uh, uh, went to Brown and then went to Yale, <coughs> excuse me, went to Yale for a nursing degree, and that's where she met her first husband. Uh, at, at Yale, and then they went on to live in Connecticut for a while, and then we were in Los Angeles when, actually, when she and I met at my 25th reunion. Uh, let's see, what was your major at Brown? Chemistry. Chemistry. And so you'd already committed to going to medical school and going to, oh, how did you get into Harvard at medical school? Let me, let's go right there. 
uh, how did I get into it? Well, I had, first I had to apply. I had to apply to any school to get into it. And I, I'd applied to three. I applied to the University of Illinois, applied to Northwestern, because they were both close at hand where we lived, uh, and to Harvard Medical School. And um, um, I was accepted, um, and they called me at, late at night and asked me, uh, told me I'd been accepted. I was sound asleep, and a little groggy, and I thought it was probably some, some crank on the other end of the line pulling a joke on me, so I said I wasn't going to come. Uh, and a little bit later, a letter came following up the conversation, which indicated it was real. So I went home for Christmas, still um, having turned Harvard down, at least verbally. And my mother said, you did what? <laughs> she said, I want you to write them a nice apologetic letter and tell them that if they will take you in, you'll be glad to come. So mothers being mothers, I followed her good advice and wrote them a nice letter and they said yes they would still take me in so that's how I got there. You were lucky. I was lucky. <laughs> I mean you were lucky that they lucky that they, they lucky that they still took me, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, what let's see, why did you choose to specialize in internal medicine at Harvard? Um, well, in, in medical school, there's a, a curriculum which puts you through most of the specialties in, in that surgery and pathology and ophthalmology and so on. Um, and I preferred the ones where you do thinking, and I wasn't particularly good with children, so I ended up, and I didn't want to deliver babies, um, and, and, and so that ended up with internal medicine, but which is a fairly broad field. It, encompasses endocrinology, but cardiology and gastroenterology and neurology, a whole variety of things. And uh, I decided that by the end of my third year that that's what I wanted to do. And fourth year in most medical schools gives you a number of electives. So you can select potential sub uh, fields, sub topics within the area of medicine that you want to do. And my three electives were in endocrinology, pulmonary medicine, uh, and um, Oh, renal medicine, those are the three that I selected. And then you went to Johns Hopkins Hospital, the Osler service. What feature, feature for your clinical training, um, what feature, features marked that period of your life? Well, the, John, the, the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Columbia, Harvard were probably the three best training programs in the country, at least in most people's opinion. And so, and so I put all of them down on my list, but um, being in Boston, I knew that most of the faculty, or a great many of them, had independent sources of income. And if you're going to do an academic career, you're either going to know you're very good and are sure you're going to make it, or you need to have some money just in case things don't work so well. So I concluded Boston probably was not where I was going to end up long term. Uh, and I th thought I'd better try places outside Boston just in case they um, uh, were more hospitable, so I picked Johns Hopkins, and I, it was a marvelous choice. Let's see, and then you went to the, you, you became a research associate in renal physiology um, at the National Institute of Health. How did that come about? Correct. Well, in, in medical school, um, many of us applied to go to the NIH after our internships, since at that time people were still going into the Army uh, for service time and work at the NIH was an equivalent military time. So I, I, I was one of a large group that applied uh, and I applied to two institutes and was accepted in both of them, the, the Arthritis and Metabolic Disease Institute uh, and the Heart Institute. And I elected to do the Heart Institute uh, and work with Dr. Robert Berliner, who's a wonderful man to work with. Would you say a little bit more about his uh, scientific Stature. Yeah, Dr. Berliner had come from New York at the time that the clinical center was getting started. And he'd been, he was known for his work on potassium ex uh, secretion and excretion in the, in the kidney and was, was a highly respected investigator. Um, and he'd set up the renal electrolyte division uh, with some of his colleagues. And at the time I'd come, he'd been moved into a more senior administrative position heading this group, but also one of the associate directors within the institute. So I had the fortunate privilege of working with one of the really first-rate renal physiologists of our time. Were you thinking of going in the direction of renal physiology at that point? Well, that was still open. Yeah, yeah, renal physiology was one area, but there were also some uh, endocrine uh, 
things that were looming as well. Rosalind Pitt Rivers came as a visiting professor at the NIH when I was there, and I had the chance to meet her on a few occasions, and so I asked her while I was there if she would be willing to take me in as a postdoctoral fellow after I finished my residency, which came after my time at NIH, and she, she said she would. So, Just would, from those conversations? For, just from conversation and watching her work and mm -hmm. like, so I, I was moving from the renal side to the endocrine mm -hmm. side um, while I was at NIH. Mm -hmm. Before we get to the, your time in London, um, when you did your um, clinical training in endocrinology at uh, Strong Memorial Hospital, uh, why did you decide to do it there first? Well, I'd, I'd gone to do my residency at Rochester, uh, in, at Rochester, New York, uh, in Strong Memorial Hospital, um, and the money for the fellowship in London hadn't quite arrived in time for me to leave July first, so I became an endocrine fellow for about six months until the funds arrived to, to go to London. So it was a six months hiatus that I was an endocrine fellow at, at Strong Memorial Hospital from 1960, let's see if I can get the times right, probably 1961 to late 1961. Um, so when you decided to take your National Science Foundation Fellowship at Mill Hill, right. um, You'd already set that up right. with Rosin, okay. Uh, and then uh, what projects did you do when you got there? Um, I'd begun work um, um, actually at the end of my NIH period on the relationship of the sympathetic nervous system to thyroid hormone. And that's the area that we pursued uh, while I was in, um, uh, in Mill Hill. We did some studies on looking at what happens when you thyroidectomized animals in terms of their response to sympathetic uh, drugs, and we got that published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation way back, way back then when you could still publish there easily. Would you say a little bit about the scientific stature of Rosalind Pitt Rivers and, and also, I guess, Sir Charles Harrington? Yes. Um, at the you worked with him there, too. At the time I went to uh, Mill Hill, Sir Charles Harrington was the head of the institute, so he, he was in charge of the entire research operation. Uh, one of the one of the giants in endocrinology in the in the 20th century, uh, he was the one who just worked out the structure of thyroxin. I think about 1918, uh, and then had also done work on glutathione and its structure. And uh, uh, after that, so he'd had two major contributions to science. Uh, but he was a man about ready to retire. And Dr. Pitt Rivers uh, was much younger. And she'd come uh, working with him, and her major contribution was the discovery with Jack Gross of triodothyrony. And their publication of that paper, I think 1953, was a landmark for the field because from, we went from thyroxine now to realizing over the years that triodothyrony is probably the major active thyroid hormone. When did you first become interested in the history of medicine? And in what particular areas of history were you most interested in? Well, I mean, the history is part of our feel. I mean, it's what's developed in the past. And my interest uh, really began when I was, was at Johns Hopkins. Uh, William Osler, when he was there, and Sir William Osler, when he moved to the UK to head the Department of Medicine at Oxford, um, was a scholar in the history of medicine, a, an avid book collector, and his spirit still roamed the halls of Johns Hopkins when I was a house officer. And I began to read some of the things he wrote. One particular essay has been very influential from my career then onwards, and that's one called The Fixed Period. And he broke down the careers of academic people into their educational period, which he said goes about 20 years, their research scholarly period, which goes about 20 years, so from 20 to 40, uh, and their teaching years, which go from 40 to about 60. And he thought that since very few people after 60 contribute anything of significance, that maybe at age 60 everybody should retire. And he actually used the term, maybe we should chloroform all the people <laughs> over 60, <laughs> but, which got uh, headlines in the New York Times, but he was using that facetiously. But the idea was that after age 60, you don't make many major new contributions, art, science, or anything else. Uh, 
So that sort of set my career in motion here. I was already past 20, of course, so I was finishing my educational years. I was preparing when I was going to NIH and subsequently for my research segment, and then down the road came my teaching and administrative segment. So that's where I got into the field, and subsequently my interests have been around endocrinology, internal medicine, then a few broader areas. While you were in London, what were your plans as an academic physician? Well, one more time, I'm not going to waste anybody. And uh, Chris, this is a pickup, and go. While you were in London, uh, did you have plans? Uh, what were your plans as your academic career? Well, my peer, London was sort of a, an additional fellowship. You know, you need to get the training for the career you're going to pursue. I was, had gone from renal physiology now to endocrinology, um, and I needed to come back, I thought, and get more training in endocrinology. So I, I elected before I left to come back to work with uh, Professor Astwood at New England Medical Center Hospital in order to complete my training in the clinical aspects of endocrinology. And that's what I did when I came back from, from, uh, from London. Now, one of the little interesting pieces, we were coming back from London in, uh, in October of 1982, uh, sorry, 72. My years, I'm gonna have to go back over this. Let me get my years right. When, uh, sorry, 62, I'm off by 20 years, aren't I? We'll do a, we'll, uh, Chris, pick up. We were coming back from London. Pick it right. Right. Uh, we were coming back from London uh, in the fall of 1962, October, and this turned out to be the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. That the U.S. Navy was, as we were on our ship moving from the, the United Kingdom to New York, the American Navy was getting down ready to to uh, blockade the ships that were coming from Russia to, with missiles on them, and Khrushchev turned them around. And I've often, my wife, so I was following this crisis from my uh, shipboard news uh, as we were going, and I guess if there were going to be a nuclear war, it, we might have been as well off as anybody being out in the ocean. I'm glad I didn't have to find out, but that was really a uh, tense time in uh, for yeah, all that, of us. Was, that almost happened. It almost happened. That was a that was a very nearly a catastrophe. And how did you um, come to? How did you meet Ted Ashwood and and uh, end up working with him? How did that come about? Well, in the days when you, when we traveled by train mostly, um, I'd gone up to Boston to interview uh, with him before I'd gone to London, so I'd already planned to do that. You have to plan far enough ahead that you can meet the people you're going to work with beforehand. And he had a position on the training grant, which he had, uh, for endocrinologists. And he said, yes, I could come back and join the group. So I did in the, in the fall of 1962. Would you say a little bit about his scientific statue? Yes. Uh, I'm, Dr. Astwood was, was a true genius and, and a, a real giant in the field of endocrinology. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, based on his work with antithyroid drugs many years earlier, but he had also developed uh, the ACTH gel methodology, so he was a good peptide chemist as well as a good uh, uh, physician scientist, really a, an all-around uh, scholar human being. What research were you doing on the thyroid at that time? When I, when I came back, um, I had the good fortune to meet... Chris, pick up when I came back. Yeah. When I came back, I had the good fortune to work with H. Maurice Goodman, another postdoctoral fellow who'd finished his PhD at Harvard. And Mo was interested in adipose tissue, and I was interested in the thyroid. So we decided to ask uh, questions about how triiodothyronine does what it does to adipose tissue, how long that takes, what the processes are that are involved in this. And we published uh, well, half a dozen papers together over the next couple of years. Uh, before do, uh, Dr. Goodman moved to the University of Massachusetts' new campus in Worcester, where he became chairman of physiology and switched himself to growth hormone as opposed to thyroid hormone, because growth hormone had been his primary interest. So that's where I started off. And one day in, in, when Dr. Goodman and I were doing our experiment, um, Professor Astwood came in and brought with him some 
rats that he'd just gotten that were genetically obese. They had obesity inherited as a Mendelian recessive trait. Uh, and uh, he said, wouldn't that be an interesting thing to study? And I had never given any thought to studying obesity before. I'd seen obese patients and so on, but never given that much thought. Uh, but at his urging, began to think about what could be done with them. And as I looked back, I, I wondered if his interest in the problem wasn't a reflection of the presidential address which he was preparing to give to the Endocrine Society uh, with the title, The Heritage of Corpulence. Here were these genetically obese rats and he was giving a talk and had been thinking about some of those issues. So I began to work on uh, models that could be used to compare the genetic obese animals with some other kind of obesity that wasn't genetic because you have to be able to sort out what comes first, the obesity or the things you're studying. So that's where my career began. And did you know that you were uh, changing careers at that point? Or? Well, I had two. I was still working with Dr. Goodman on thyroid hormone effects on adipose tissue, uh, and I was beginning to set up models for the uh, fatty rats. And, and as you know, you need money to fund research projects. And so I decided to write two NIH grants, one on the thyroid and adipose tissue work, and one on the genetic models of obesity. And in those days, uh, the uh, NIH still had in-person study sections <clears throat> that met, and they also sent out site visits to review grants at the institution for the investigator. So they sent out a team to look at both of my grants at the same time, so I was presenting to the same endocrine study section two different projects. Uh, so they took them back and evaluated them, and the one on thyroid hormone and adipose tissue didn't do very well, and the one on the genetic obesity in rats was right at the top of the pack. So that set my career from one direction to the other, and I haven't looked back. Okay. At the time you entered the field, what was the awareness of obesity as a public health issue or within the medical community as some kind of problem? at that time? Well, at the time I started, um, obesity was prob had a prevalence of about 14% in the U.S. population. Uh, and there were a number of people who felt that even at that level it was a major public health problem, but certainly nothing like the public health problem we see now. But it was a few years later as I moved from Boston to Los Angeles that the Fogarty International Center at NIH began to plan um, conferences. It was set up in honor of a Congressman Fogarty from Rhode, Rhode Island. Uh, and it was set up because he championed NIH and so they set up this institute with his name on it. And it was designed mainly for international research projects or for conferences. And when they were selecting conferences after their formation about 1970, they picked um, uh, two as their first. Diabetes is number one and obesity was the second one because they believed then that obesity was a big enough coming health problem that it needed to be looked at in a serious fashion. Uh, okay, after eight years in Boston, you uh, left for Tufts at the, for, you, you decided to leave Tufts for Harbor, Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Uh, how were you recruited there? Well, it was, it was an interesting transition. Um, uh, Dr. Astwood told us in uh, 1968 that he was going to retire in 1970, so we began to plan a, a symposium to honor him uh, at Tufts with some of his uh, former students. Uh, and shortly after that, the chairman of the Department of Medicine, Dr. Proger, also indicated that he would be retiring at about the same time. So that left two major holes in major leadership positions at Tufts. And about the time uh, that I was learning of these developments, uh, David Solomon, who had just moved from the main campus at UCLA down to Harbor Hospital, I was a thyroidologist and someone I admired, called me and asked me if I would be interested in considering directing their clinical research center at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center. And I had was kind of reluctant to move west because I liked uh, Boston a lot, uh, but I went out to visit and was 
pleasantly surprised. And um, one day in February, um, as I was looking out my uh, window, uh, the te thermometer said 10 degrees. And having shoveled my driveway several times that winter, uh, and, and I was asked myself, did I really want to do that for the next 30 years? And a, a silent voice came up and said, no. And so I, I accepted the position in Los Angeles in early 1970 and moved in the summertime. What was Harbor UCLA Medical Center like in, when you first got there? Well, Harbor, it was Harbor Hospital, which is a, one of the components of the Los Angeles County healthcare system. Uh, it was a hospital, it was a teaching hospital for UCLA, had been in use uh, since the end of World War II, um, but wasn't nearly the prime hospital until Dr. Solomon went down to take over chairmanship. And Dr. Solomon uh, had worked with Dr. Astwood earlier, that's how he knew my, of me, um, and he was um, uh, a, a well-trained thyroidologist um, and he brought a, a, a a superb reputation to Harbor. So he began to recruit people to go to the Harbor Hospital and he recruited two other superb endocrinologists, William O'Dell, a reproductive um, endocrinologist from NIH, and Delbert Fisher, uh, who's a pediatric endocrinologist and, and um, subsequently editor of the JCEM and president of the Endocrine Society. So these two were already there when I came out to visit so it made a very interesting group when I arrived. Um, it, it, it was a super group, and we went on to have one of the best endocrine training programs in the country for the next decade. What were your responsibilities as director of the CRC? Well, as the director of any clinical research center has to do two things. He has to get people to use it and use it himself and to make sure that the facilities that people need to have the beds, the nurses, the other facilities are, are, are available. So that's what I did. And how did you, when you, when you first got there, or after you'd set everything up, how did you divide your day or, or your week? How, how much time did you spend research, teaching? Um, well, you do, medical teaching is usually blocks of time on the medical ward supervising interns and residents. And I did three or four months a year of that. We had a regular twice a week endocrine clinic, uh, one focusing more on diabetes and one on general endocrinology. We had a, a weekly endocrine rounds, which Dr. O'Dell ran. He was a super teacher. In fact, so was Dell Fisher and, and Dave Solomon. It was a wonderful teaching environment. So we had all of those clinical activities and we did our research time, both basic and, and clinical in between. Making a long day, I must say. What were you looking at in the 1970s regarding classifying and quantifying obesity and identifying its causes? Well, ob obesity is many different things. We use, it sounds like a single disease, but it's clearly not. We already knew that it could be, be produced by hypothalamic injury. That went back to the turn of the 19th century. 1900 and 1901. We knew that it could be caused by hyperactivity of the adrenal glands, Cushing's disease. Uh, we knew that it could be caused genetically, our fatty rats, but there were also some other rare diseases that caused it. And we knew that it could be caused in humans by injury to the hypothalamus. So my uh, program in obesity research was animal models hypothalamic, genetic, and dietary, and in humans, very similar groups. We began, when I was in Boston, some studies with overfeeding. Uh, we had patients with hypothalamic injury, uh, and we had people who had genetic kinds of diseases. So we, I tried to get a, a, a platform that encompassed basic studies, animal study, uh, clinical studies, looking at different models of obesity in each one. Now, at this point, was obesity considered to be an epidemic? Um, obesity, when I moved from Boston to uh, Los Angeles, was still about 15% prevalence rate. The uh, measures that had been conducted by the National Center for Health Statistics, which is how we get our major data, um, were conducted in 1960 to 62, in 19 uh, 76 to 80, and then beginning again in 1988. The prevalence rates of obesity from that first survey 
to the one from 1976 to 80, which is while I was in Los Angeles, uh, uh, were essentially the same, something like 15%. It wasn't until the end of the 80s and early 90s that the uptick in prevalence rates began. So, no, it was not, it had not become far more prevalent than it was when I was in Boston or when I was in medical school. But you had, when you started, as far as your awareness of it, it had changed um, drastically. Well, my, my awareness was based on the research the things I was doing, the rats, right. And we knew that there were genetically obese forms of rats, but we'd known even earlier than that that there were genetically obese mice that were, that they'd been described in the 1950s. Um, but those important genetic lessons took a long time to get into the broader field. It really wasn't until the 1990s with the discovery of leptin, the cause for all of those genetic types of obesity, that it really made a big impact. But the epidemic of obesity had occurred beginning probably sometime after 1980, maybe 80, 82, but we didn't pick it up for a few years. So you, you were still looking at it basically the same way you started out looking at it. You, you didn't know the field was going to become what it No, I you, thought I had a nice, quiet little place to work, be a happy little camper, and nobody would bother me very much. <laughs> so it, was, it was a very easy place to work. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the hunters and gatherers as a background to, the, to your, what you're going to be doing in your research and how you're going to be looking at obesity. Could, and I know you've studied the hunters and gatherers. Could you tell me a little bit about what you've learned from them? Well, our knowledge of hunters and gatherers in modern times is limited to only a few pockets of them around the globe. Uh, but prior to the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago, we were all hunters and gatherers. We had to catch the food we had and the, I, and the kind of diet that our Paleolithic ancestors ate has been an area of considerable interest and some people say we have, maybe should go back to eat like that again. But we've had several periods in the, since the beginning of the agricultural revolution. We had the initial grain crops that came along, but still lots of meat and still lots of hunting going with it. Um, as we've come into the last hundred years or more as, as machine processing for food, uh, as uh, um, uh, grinding techniques, as food processing techniques have improved, we've we've drastically changed our agricultural uh, food supply in very, in some detrimental ways, mostly recently, um, mostly since the last um, 50 or 100 years. Um, if you look at sugar production, sugar is one of these crops that had to come along somewhere. It probably came out of Indonesia 15,000, 15, hundred years ago, two thousand years, somewhere just around the uh, time of Christ. It, it moved into India, was then refined, and its sweetness was recognized, and it was the um, uh, slave trade in the, in the Indies and Brazil and the United States that made it possible to cultivate and grow enough of this to make a big market. And since about uh, 1,600 sugar consumption has just gone up in a linear fashion worldwide. There's never been a time or almost never where all of that crop that we produce isn't eaten. So it's, it's, it's been one that's changed the way we've looked at things. And I became interested in that whole issue some years later from my interest in dietary factors that might be related to obesity, and particularly fructose and high fructose corn syrup. But that's a, that's a later, that's a lot later. That's after I got to Baton Rouge and um, well after Los Angeles. While you were at UCLA, were you asking questions about uh, surgery for obesity? Was that something you were thinking of then? When I went to Los Angeles, um, the uh, treatments were, uh, good ones were not common. Uh, we had some drugs which had been developed in the 1960s, fentramine and uh, some other sympathomimetics, but they were not entirely desirable. And, and at that time in the, in the 1960s, uh, surgery appeared on the horizon from two sides. One was a man named uh, uh, Mason 
in Iowa who developed the gastric bypass in 1967. And the other one slightly earlier than that was, was the, the jejunal ileal bypass. And when we were in Los Angeles, that was one of the procedures that we pursued as an investigation. Well, I think we performed a hundred of those cases. The surgeons did, I didn't, I'm not a surgeon. I'm an endocrinologist who uh, takes an interest in the before and after treatment, but the, the surgeons did the operations. Uh, and we, we, we had about a hundred patients who underwent this operation with intensive study of the relationships of the changed intestine to uh, the before and after operation, um, adipose tissue function, appetite, and other metabolic responses. What were the key, uh, what was the key research that you did at that time, UCLA period? Um, the, um, my research was, 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 again, using my two models, my genetic obese models and my, my uh, uh, human ones. I think the prader willi syndrome work was one of the most interesting. This is one of those models that we picked up in Los Angeles, did almost all the work on while there. Uh, one day we were in clinic, and I'd seen a couple of cases, and one of the residents started to present a patient. The patient was an individual who was, uh, was 21 years of age when we saw them, who had been a, a difficult birth, who had been very inactive in utero, um, who had begun to eat shortly after birth, and had then become very obese, was a, a floppy, that is, was, had a relatively poor motion, muscles weren't strong, uh, and who was uh, marginally developmentally functional. Their brain, their grade, uh, work grade in school was just barely keeping up. And this is the almost typical description of the prader willi syndrome. And this resident had never heard of it, nor had the family ever heard of it. And since then, it's become a very well-recognized syndrome. And we began to collect cases from around California. And during the course of my time there, we uh, studied 40 patients with this problem. Um, and one of the things they don't do is have uh, sexual reproduction. They, they don't develop secondary sexual characteristics. And with Dr. O'Dell and his colleagues who do reproductive bi biology in our, as, as the head of our endocrine section, uh, this was an ideal collaborative study between their reproductive interests and this problem in obesity, which came first. So we did some studies to, to examine the reproductive function and found that a drug called clomiphene, which modifies estrogen receptors, receptors in the brain, would turn on the reproductive system of these children. At, uh, and when we took it away, they, their reproductive system returned to its prepubertal state. So this was one of our major projects out of the time at UCLA. Uh, what, what led you in this time period, uh, in the early 70s we're talking about now, what led you to begin thinking about maybe institutionalizing obesity? Well, by, by the word institutionalizing obesity, it sounds like you're going to put it away in a, in a, in a, in a yeah, prison someplace. But I, I, would, I would call it maybe, maybe providing a flat platform for interchange of ideas in a field that really had none. Um, my interest in the history of medicine has shown me that, that subspecialization has occurred almost continuously since the scientific endeavor began right after the printing press in a serious manner. Um, and it was actually the ophthalmologists who became the first subspecialty to form their own college. And we've gone on and on with more and more subspecialties forming. And, it was becoming clear that obesity was getting to be a big enough field that, that might be needed here. In 1972, um, I was invited to a meeting in Germany, uh, and at the same meeting was a man named Alan Howard. And I'd known of Alan Howard uh, for a couple of years because he and a colleague in London had published a book on the proceedings that a British association had put together about obesity. So they'd formed an association for the study of obesity in the United Kingdom in mid-1960s and had a meeting in 1968 that they published in a small uh, book. And I'd gotten the book and read it. And I thought, there's an interesting platform. Maybe there's a need for some kind of developments like that in the United States. So Alan and I were at this meeting, and we are about the same age. 
And we, so we decided we'd um, have a glass of wine down by the Rhine River. We were in, in Bingen am Rhine, a nice little town overlooking the river. So we had our glasses of white wine and began to sort of look into the crystal ball and ask what, what might be needed in the field to, to provide a platform for interchange of ideas and of, of interaction of personnel that were interested in the problem of obesity. Um, and three things came out of the meeting. Um, the first was uh, that there was need for international meetings to do this. Um, the Fogarty Center that I mentioned a little earlier uh, picked obesity as one of its major topics and I was the chair of that committee and this was going to meet in 1973. Uh, and Alan and I decided that there was a need for a broader international congress and he undertook organizing that for London in 1974. Uh, and while we were doing that, we said, well, don't you think we need a journal to publish papers from people who have an interest in obesity? Uh, and the uh, publisher for the proceedings from that first International Congress in London agreed to underwrite the International Journal of Obesity, which Alan and I began to put together. We published the first issue in 1977. Uh, it's getting close to its 35th year now. Uh, and um, we also realized that at some point there would be need for an American association similar to what it existed in the United Kingdom, but that was still a few years away. But this meeting in 1972 essentially set for the two of us a, a platform for developments over the next uh, decade. So when you, first got, when you first got to UCLA, you imagined it was going to be this quiet little place for yourself where you could do this research. And now you're beginning to make the, you're, you're beginning to see something that's making you um, want to set up this platform. Is that, is that right? Did, did you, or were you just still thinking it was going to be a small platform for a, a relatively, um, well, 15%, I guess? Well, the field was still relatively small. Um, the big explosion in academic interest has come after the explosion in the numbers of over yeah, I'm just wondering how, what you saw that, that... Well, we saw that there was enough interest in it uh, that it, like most other areas, needed a, a platform for interaction. If, if you look at the, uh, the Endocrine Society, when I was a youngster, back when Dr. Astwood's day, our journal was, a, was published in a five by seven inch size, and you could read the whole journal each month, um, and we did. Um, and it gradually began to grow, and I, uh, at one point it was thousands of pages long, and, uh, and the eight and a half by 11 size. So our field has been growing. All fields have been growing. Science is a logarithmically expanding area, and 75% of all scientists who have ever lived are now living and practicing science. And the doubling time for journals, as I learned in my um, interest in the history has been about 20 years, a little 20 to 30 years. So uh, doubling in the number of journals every 20 years, at the time I started in the field, there were no journals dealing with obesity. Uh, by the time we put our first one out uh, to the present time, there are now about 15 of them. So that, that what I was seeing was just a reflection of what goes on in, and has been going on for, for three or four hundred years. So, you're talking about the, the natural growth of the a subspecialty. Of, of, it hadn't, you, you weren't being affected yet by what was going to happen. Not, the, well, we were right, we were at the beginning of that. There were enough of us interest. The fact that there was interest enough in the United Kingdom to set up an association for the study of obesity, the fact that the Fogarty Center picked obesity as its second conference, said that there was already a growing interest in this area. Uh, but that growth has gotten much steeper in the past uh, 30 years, but there was nonetheless enough, enough underpinnings that it was clear that there was going to be need for, for some kind of structural relations. Why did you leave Harbor UCLA for the University of Southern California Medical Center in 1981? I made a transition between the two schools uh, following my sabbatical. I had a sabbatical in uh, 1978, which lasted for nine months. And at the end of that sabbatical, um, I got a call from the man I'd worked with. My, my sabbatical was divided in three parts. 
I spent three months at Berkeley looking at energy expenditure. I spent three months um, in Washington working in the Department of Health and Human Services on some issues we would had from the uh, congressional hearings that earlier that decade about that led to the dietary guidelines. And the third part was spent in, in Sweden and, and London. Uh, and in the third part of that, I got a call from the man I'd been working with in Washington on the second part of my sabbatical saying, wouldn't I like to come to Washington to be the first nutrition coordinator in the Department of Health and Human Services? And my chairman of medicine was gracious enough to say he would allow me to take the extra time. So I spent nine months in Washington, D.C. Um, working as nutrition coordinator. But as time wore on, I, I could see that my clinical research skills were vanishing and my political skills, I didn't think were going to come up to snuff for this field. So I decided at the end of nine months that I needed to go back to my basic work. But having been gone for 18 months, I was a little rusty. So in the interim, I decided I would make a, some changes in what I was going to do. And, the chairman at USC offered me a job to run the diabetes section, and that seemed like a good transition from where I had been uh, to a new job. And what was the state of that section when you got there? Uh, it was the, its director had had just left. Uh, it was uh, we had an inpatient ward. There were several physicians doing diabetes research, um, and I had a number of very fine people come work with me over my my years while I was there. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a time when I was fulfilling some of what uh, Osler had said about those years after you, your, your research years, because I was already now over 40 and, you know, you should be doing other things like teaching. So I was doing more teaching. I was doing more service. I was on the uh, advisory committee for the NIDDK for four years, on the Board of Regents of the College of Physicians for four years. So I was spending a lot of time doing service-related activities, teaching, mentoring my younger colleagues in doing obesity research, and we did a good deal of that, too. Would you comment on your founding of the North American Association for the Study of Obesity, now the Obesity Society, 1982? Yeah. Well, we go back to 1972, when Alan Howard and I had our meeting in, um, in Bing and Nam Rhine with our glass of wine thinking about the future, it was clear that there was a need for a North American group. Uh, we got our international congresses off the ground, the journal was off the ground, um, and in 1980, a colleague uh, from the University of Washington, John Brunzel, uh, suggested when he and I were on the Nutrition Committee for the Heart Association that um, the time was getting close to where we needed an, an obesity association of some kind in the United States. And I didn't think there were quite enough of us to have a research association for just the U.S., so we decided to make it the North American one, including Canada, the U.S., and, and Mexico. Uh, and um, I began to put together a, a meeting plan for 1982, which included a grant from NIH for a childhood obesity meeting, uh, and, a, and a program of additional abstracts. And uh, so I began to write letters and solicit funds and got a program put together, which was the first meeting of the North American Association for the Study of Obesity, a long word, NASO as we call it, uh, which met at, at uh, Vassar College in October of 1982. Uh, and the committee that organized it, Marcy Greenwood, was chair of medicine, Wayne Calloway, who had followed me as one of the uh, nutrition coordinators at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services was the second, I was the third, and we had a meeting with, that was this symposium from NIH and 39 abstracts submitted for this meeting. So it was a small meeting, 39 abstracts compared to the thousands that are seen at the Endocrine Society today. It was a pretty small meeting, but it was a first start. What were you looking at in the 1980s, or maybe sum up what you had been looking at, uh, up until the late 1980s regarding classifying and quantifying obesity and identifying its causes. We went back and talked about the genetics of obesity when I switched from thyroid to obesity with Professor Astwood. Um, 
along that same vein, one of the models we picked for study was overfeeding. We overfeed rats with a high fat diet, but we do humans by asking them to eat too much. Uh, and in, in the early phases of my career, I had the privilege of working with Ethan Sims at the University of Vermont, who began what are now known as the Vermont Studies, where he asked people to overeat to gain 25% of their body weight. So we had an opportunity to do that study early in my career, and overfeeding studies have resurfaced several times in my career, and I'll catch those in a, in a moment. The second one that began at the same time to complement the animal studies were studies in hypothalamic obesity. And we were able to show by studying four patients from the neurosurgery department uh, who had had injuries to their hypothalamus and who became markedly obese, that the control of insulin secretion was disordered relative to people who had obesity not from hypothalamic injury. So those two, kind, those two models, hypothalamic obesity and overfeeding obesity, were two that we picked up early on from our animal studies that we pursued as part of our clinical portfolio of types of, of clinical obesity. When I went to Los Angeles, um, overfeeding became one of the studies I wanted to conduct to look at whether when you overeat are you uh, as efficient in your muscular work as you are when you don't overeat. And so we were going to overfeed some healthy young men to gain weight, and I thought I should be the first volunteer. So I began my studies um, on myself. Um, I thought I would just double what I ate. Instead of eating one sandwich, I'd eat two for lunch. And I was in visiting with Dr. Solomon one day at the beginning of this study, and I took out my two sandwiches and two apples and two of everything else. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm beginning an overfeeding study in a few months, and I want to see what it's like to gain weight. And he said, are you sure you should be doing that? I said, well, you know, I'm going to ask them to do it. I think I should do it first. So over the next uh, four months, from January to 1972 to about uh, April, I went from 165, which is my usual weight, where I still am, to 196, gained 30 pounds, which is one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had. I had only two pairs of pants I could wear. I couldn't button any of my shirts. Uh, I was warm, and I was so full in the stomach that I couldn't sit down, so it was a very uncomfortable experience. But I knew that's what I was going to be asking others to do, so I did it to myself. As soon as my study of myself was finished, uh, my weight literally fell off, and I came down within another six weeks back to where I have always been before, before and after. So we picked up those threads um, at, when I was at USC. Uh, we, we decided to look at one of the gastrointestinal peptides, uh, we, which modify food intake, um, choli, and this is cholecystokinin which is a peptide secreted by the bowel, which is important for uh, gallbladder contraction, but which also reduces food intake. And we were interested in whether these individuals that we'd begun to study at Tufts and continued on at USC that had injuries in their brains and were obese, whether they would respond to CCK the way other obese people did. So we set up a trial using the Clinical Research Center and showed that they would, that they responded so that whatever was damaging their usual controls was not impairing their response to this small peptide. So my, my career has really been one of, of following different models of obesity in the animal or in human beings and asking questions about how it manifests itself. I'd like to talk about your time when you uh, transferred to Pennington, but first would you outline the founding and building and design of the Pennington Biomedical Research Center? Yes, the Pennington Biomedical Research Center is a fascinating structure and institution. Um, it was made possible by a gift from uh, a, a wealthy oil man in Baton Rouge, uh, and he'd been an oil wildcatter most of his life, and in 1970 he discovered oil finds that were worth about $100 million. Um, and in 1980, 
Um, he discovered oil just north of Baton Rouge in a joint venture, I think, with Texaco that was worth a billion dollars. So he became the first billionaire in, in Louisiana. And he let it be known that he was going to uh, give money away in order to avoid paying taxes on a billion dollars. That's a lot of taxes to pay on, on the royalties from it. So people were making pitches to him about what they would do with the money if they had it. And the president of the university went in. Uh, they began to have their chit chat uh, about what they were going to do. And he, he noted, the president of the university, that there were a number of bottles along the windowsill. Um, and when he got a look at them, they were vitamin bottles, vitamin C, vitamin B12, vitamin E. Um, and so when they sat down again, um, what, uh, what Dr. Copping, the president of the university, said to Mr. Pennington, he said, what LSU needs is a nutrition research center. Mr. Pennington stood up and put his right hand up. And see, he said, you got your $100 million. Now that would, that would make anybody's day if someone said you got your $100 million. When they finished the final settlements, it turned out to be about $125 million. And at that time, it was the largest single gift to an American university from a single individual. So LSU had $125 million in a special medical research fund that was a uh, biomedical research fund that was to operate this nutrition research center, which they didn't know what they were going to do with. So Dr. Copping, who had gotten the gift, worked with various faculty members uh, to design a building and that when the interest was big enough, they built a $26 million research facility with nearly a quarter million square feet of space using the interest on the $125 million. So there it sat in the fields of Louisiana on a 250-acre parcel of land, uh, unoccupied for about two years. And the, and the press was giving the university a hard time. What are you doing with this great big white elephant sitting out there empty? Uh, and that's sort of where I began to come into the story. Um, about 1987 or 88, they were writing letters, I think it was late 87, to various people around the country asking if they would be interested in being the director of this nutrition research center. Um, and I was well enough known in nutrition and obesity areas that I got a letter. And I read it over and I, it, was, it seemed kind of interesting. So I went up to talk to my department chair at USC. And um, he said, well, he didn't usually recommend people look at jobs, uh, but he said this was an unusual one and I probably should look at it. He said, you know, you have 10,000 square foot research space in the lower floor of this research building, and there are four other floors above you, so four, three other floors above you, so it's 40,000 square feet in your wing. Um, and in the next wing, there's another 40,000 square feet, so it's 80,000 square feet in this whole building, of which you have an eighth. And he said, they're offering you about three buildings that size in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he says, you know, that's, that's, that's worth looking at. So I went down there in January 1988 um, and was picked up at the airport and met all the right people. And over the next uh, few months, we worked out an arrangement where I ended up going to Baton Rouge. What were your main accomplishments there as first director? Well, when you come to an empty building um, with 10 people, in 250,000 square feet, that's 10,000 square feet per person. That's a fair amount of space to rattle around in. Uh, we were fortunate in getting uh, grants um, to help operate the institution. We got one from the Department of Agriculture through what are called earmarks. They're appropriations that specifically put in a bill by members of Congress, the sort of thing that many congressmen don't like that would help equip the building, and we got uh, $2 million for that. And we got uh, about $3 million from the nutrition program of the U.S. Army. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting story about the U.S. Army. The, the nutrition money was cut out of the existing nutrition budget, and the man who ran the budget was a little unhappy when someone took $3 million from him. Uh, so he um, went down to visit the Pennington Center to see where this $3 million is going to be used. Uh, and when he got there, um, there were no scientists there. There was a man who was, who was the 
a security guard sitting in the front lobby, but that was about all. And so he asked his host, where, well, take me to where the scientists are gonna spend this $3 million are. Uh, and so they took him to meet the governor of the state of Louisiana, which uh, was, so he came back to Washington very unhappy. Um, well, Dr. Copping was aware of this sort of unhappiness and he asked Dr. Ryan, who became my right hand person um, in the clinical area, if she would take on how we spent the money in Baton Rouge to make it a win-win situation for everyone. So she met with the people at Natick, which is the nutrition research facility for the Army. Um, and they said there were two or three needs they had. The first one, they needed a, uh, a stable isotope facility that could help them measure energy expenditure. This is at a time when a technique called a doubly labeled water uh, became available. It, and it's a way of measuring energy expenditure by giving someone uh, O18 in deuterium labeled water. And the, these are then taken into the metabolic processes and excreted as urine, water in the urine or as CO2 in the expired air. And by measuring the rate of change of these in the body, you can get an estimate of how much carbon dioxide is being produced and therefore how much metabolism is going on. So you can measure energy expenditure over two weeks period of time, roughly. And so the Army was interested in this to learn what the metabolic requirements of troops were in different combat situations. So we agreed to set up a stable isotope laboratory at the Pennington Center and conduct studies with them on energy requirements of troops in Colorado and in desert climates. So, so they, they got an enormous benefit from that. The second was their need for clinical uh, research facilities that could do blood samples for them. And we, so we set up a clinical uh, laboratory that they could ship samples to for their purposes. The third, they were interested in uh, what could be done to provide special forces, these uh, SEALs and, and uh, Green Berets with the best nutritional uh, products that we could get, today's food supply. So we took in a number of these special forces over the next couple of years, uh, and they would run a marathon every third, every other day, Monday through Friday for us, uh, and uh, in between they'd go outside and run another marathon. <laughs> they were just unbelievably well-trained, smart, capable men. Uh, and with uh, our nutritional uh, facilities, we prepared a nutritional program, which they currently use for these special forces in the field. So the Army has been happy enough with that initial carve out to have actually continued to fund nutrition research programs that benefit both groups for the last uh, 25 years. So that's where we got started. We got started with money that came to us, not necessarily by people wanting it to come there, but which has been extremely valuable in our operation. The second thing we had to do, I came to an empty building, so it had no identity. And if you're going to be a good research facility, you have to be recognized. Your brand, so to speak, has to be identified. So we had to brand the Pennington Center as a, an, an institute which was excellent in biomedical research. Um, and with nut for nutrition. For nutrition, yes. And my field was obesity, and the early people we had were nutritionists. So we would go off to meetings, and instead of saying we were from Louisiana State University, which wasn't a, a scientifically outstanding brand, uh, we would identify ourselves as from the Pennington Center uh, and let that be our brand. This is exactly what Dr. Solomon had done when I was at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. When he traveled, he didn't identify Harbor as UCLA because he wanted to brand it as a separate institution. So when he would go to meetings, because he was a well-known thyroidologist, he would identify his research as from Harbor Hospital. And that's what most of us did. So we identified Harbor Hospital as a separate brand from the main campus at UCLA. And when I went to Baton Rouge, um, what I accomplished in the first couple of years were to brand Pennington Center as a brand separate from the LSU brand. Would you outline the development of the core 
current core treatment for obesity and comment on its efficacy. I mean, my, uh, view com my views of obesity treatment have been strongly influenced by my clinical trial experience. When I uh, was at the University of Southern California, most of my research work, except the intensive things on the Clinical Research Center, uh, were uh, with basic science, were, were studies of neurotransmitters, were studies of adrenalectomy and its effect on obesity, of vagotomy and things that were quite specific and animal driven. When I came to Baton Rouge, um, we, we moved into a totally different arena. I switched from being a, a focused basic scientist around my animal models or relevant clinical models to a broader base. And my thinking about obesity and its approaches has been, has been tempered by that experience. Uh, the first of these was the Diabetes Prevention Program, a program that came along in 1994 as part of a whole series of programs at, at the <coughs> Pentagon Center to which we can return in a, in a moment. But um, in the Diabetes Prevention Program, the question we asked was, could you prevent or delay uh, the development of diabetes by taking people at high risk and putting them on <coughs> the best program you could find in the behavioral context? And we've done that and have examined the role of, a, of low fat, of calories, of, a, of exercise, and what this, these sets of studies, which are still ongoing, have shown is that the com lifestyle components are largely the reduction in calories, which is conditioned by how much fat you are reduced, that activity wasn't the major component of weight loss, but it clearly plays an important control in maintaining lower weight. So that's, that's where my context for, for lifestyle approaches to obesity, which are by most people considered to be the foundation or cornerstone of most treatment programs. I'd like to ask you now about the clinical trials that you conducted while you were, well, that you began while you were at Pennington, uh, Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Uh, let's start with the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, DASH. Um, how did that trial come about? Yeah, the, uh, when, I moved to, in a, when I moved from USC to uh, the Pennington Center, NIH was in the process of doubling its budget for research. And part of that effort, uh, uh, part of that money from that effort of doubling went into some large clinical trials to answer important questions. Um, and at the time I came there, um, one of those early trials was the question of whether uh, dietary patterns influence blood pressure. There have been a number of previous trials using specific components like potassium or other things to, uh, to modify blood pressure, and they'd in general been equivocal. So the NIH decided to uh, request for applications, uh, about 80 groups applied, and there were four sites selected to participate in a study of dietary patterns and blood pressure. The sites were Harvard, Hopkins, Duke University, and the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. And that clearly made us very happy because we felt we were in a pretty good academic group when you're clustered with those other three schools. Um, the trial uh, brought people together from each of those centers to plan a diet. We actually had two diets. We had a fruits and vegetables diet uh, and we had a fruits and vegetables plus low-fat dairy products. So the fruits and vegetables were designed to uh, emphasize uh, magnesium and potassium. So they were at the higher end of magnesium potassium intake compared to the usual American diet. And the fruits, so vegetables. Fruits, but, but, I mean, there was natural Most fruits, yeah, natural fruits. Just the ordinary fruits you go out and buy. No, no, these were parts, part, it was a food diet. We were looking at foods, but you can emphasize nutrients by selecting specific foods. So if you select more fruits and vegetables, you get more magnesium and potassium. Uh, if you add low-fat dairy products to this, you add calcium. So we were comparing the usual American diet at the lower end of those nutrients, calcium, magnesium, potassium, with diets in which fruits and vegetables supplemented it or where low-fat dairy products were added in a second diet. And it turns out that we got a graded reduction in blood pressure over the eight weeks of our first trial 
uh, with between the fruits and vegetables and the low-fat dairy products, which are even better, and our, that our blood pressure was in fact reduced almost as much as you get with the good antihypertensive drugs. So it, the DASH diet is clearly a very effective dietary pattern for reducing a blood pressure in people whose blood pressure is normal or is in the low borderline elevated level. Uh, and we wrote a popular book about the diet called the DASH diet, as you might guess, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And there have been a number of other books published about it since then. And that diet's been selected uh, uh, as part of the dietary guidelines recommended diets and selected by US News and World Report as their number one diet choice. So this study ended up with a diet that has major public health impact. What about the diet, diabetes prevention program? When did that uh, trial take place? Yes, the diabetes prevention program uh, was again another request for applications for people who had plans about what they would do with a population of people who were at high risk for diabetes that has ha had impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, if they were included in the treatment program. So we were again selected uh, out of the hundred and some odd centers that applied with a group of, of 20 other sites. So we, we were again feeling that we had branded the Pennington Center as a, as a, as a respectable, uh, you know, highly respectable research entity in this context of, of clinical trials. Uh, so the, the diabetes prevention program began planning its intervention in 1994, and we began enrolling people in 1996. It took us three years to reach the 3,700 enrollees in the initial phase of the trial. Um, so by 1999, we finished enrollment, uh, and the trial was so successful that our data safety monitoring board said we already had reached our endpoint before the trial time had actually ended. So in 2002, uh, we terminated, we were asked to terminate the initial trial. We published the data and then began an interim trial where we offered all the people who hadn't had the intensive lifestyle arm the chance to have it while we retooled to go on to the diabetes prevention outcome study, which has been going on for the last 10 plus years. So we're now reaching our 15, 20th year of this trial and it is uh, under review for an additional five years. What is sibutramine? Um, sibutramine is a drug that's used for uh, treating obesity. It's a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor um, and was uh, uh, developed in the 1990s. It was underwent clinical trials, was approved by the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and then uh, withdrawn recently because of uh, the issue of concerns about cardiovascular risk. And what trials did you conduct with it? We were part of the initial um, so-called phase three. When a, when a drug's developed in a company with that small number that get to the other end, you start with drug discovery, you come up with a molecule that looks good, it goes first in man in fixed doses, short time, called phase one. It go, then if, that, if it passes that and it's not toxic and works, you then go to phase two, which is proof of principle, a relatively small number of subjects in a shorter term trial. Uh, and if that works, you then go to large scale so-called phase three trials, which are the basis for drug approval. And we were in the phase, one of the centers in the phase three trials for sibutramine. And what were the results? Uh, and the results of our trial was that this package of trials went to the FDA and they approved the drug for use in treating obesity. And how satisfied were you with, this, with the trial? Well, it was, a, it was a good trial. We, um, we, we showed that the drug produced weight loss. Um, its major side effect is that it also raises blood pressure, and this was clear to us in the initial trial. Um, and the question that concerned regulators about it was, was the increase in blood pressure and pulse rate, which were modest, uh, enough to offset the benefits you got from uh, weight loss? And in order to answer that question, we needed an outcomes trial, which is you take people at, at higher risk for heart 
trouble, you put them on the drug and you follow them for a long period. And that was done subsequent to a regulatory approval and was published as what's called the SCOUT trial, the Cybutramine Outcomes trial. And it showed that the, that the drug's effects were, um, may not have justified its, its use, so it was withdrawn from the market. When did the Action for Health and Diabetes Study of Health Outcomes of Obesity, which is the acronym for the Look Ahead, I guess. The, yes. Uh, when did that take place? The Look Ahead trial uh, began about two years after the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was another of these selection, you submit an application and they select centers. Uh, we were again one of 16 centers selected for that trial. And the question was, was uh, if you take a good intensive lifestyle intervention program and we patterned it on what the diabetes prevention program had previously developed and added to it meal portion control meals so that we could uh, help people keep, get their calories down conveniently and easily, uh, if, would that then reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease down the road? So we took people who already had diabetes as opposed to the diabetes prevention program, which is people at risk for diabetes. We took people who already had diabetes uh, and put them into this intensive lifestyle program, uh, which we've conducted for an average of nine and a half years uh, until our data safety monitoring board concluded uh, uh, last year that we would never reach statistically significant differences from our control group, and so they terminated the study not for a successful outcome, but for an unsuccessful one. That is, we had not reduced cardiovascular mortality. But the, the trial, is, that's not an entirely fair view of the trial. It did not meet the primary endpoint, but it did do a variety of other things. It improved people's quality of life. It improved their problems with sleep apnea. It improved urinary incontinence. It lowered blood pressure. It lowered medication use. So it had a lot of very beneficial effects to the people who were in the trial. Um, it, what it didn't do was give them more heart disease, but it didn't give them less either. So it was sort of neutral in that respect, uh, but positive in almost every other respect. And is that the end of that trial then? Uh, that trial is currently awaiting a decision from NIH as to whether they want to continue it or not. We don't have an outcome answer yet. Are you hopeful? Um, we're always hopeful. Life, you've got to be optimistic in life. You've got to keep hoping that things will come along. So it's still, it's, it's still, it's still, it's still under review and the, and the patients are still being seen. The trial hasn't finished. It doesn't finish till middle of next year. When did the preventing overweight using novel dietary strategies, pounds lost, study begin? Do you put those titles together? Like pounds lost? The, the preventing overweight using novel dietary strategies. We usually just call it pounds lost. It's, <laughs> it's, it's easier to do. Um, when I, I've already described my trip to becoming director of the Pennington Center, uh, and I spent 10 years in that position. And I concluded that after 10 years, it was time to step aside and let someone else take that on. So I went back into my role as, as clinical investigator. Um, I had the diabetes prevention program and look ahead both underway. Um, and a colleague who had worked with me on the DASH diet back in a, a decade earlier, and I applied for a grant from NIH to ask whether macronutrient composition of diets in a very controlled setting was an important component of the magnitude of weight loss. So if you had a high fat or low fat diet, did you lose more weight on one or the other? If you had a high carbohydrate versus a lower one, did it make a difference? If you had higher protein versus lower protein, did it make a difference? So we constructed a, a diets very carefully using basically the same foods but with different proportions of them. So you couldn't easily tell from looking at the plate what you were eating. You had to know about the portion sizes. Uh, and we conducted a two-year trial uh, with 811 people. And the upshot was very simple. It really didn't make any difference which diet you were on. It, the difference was in whether you adhered to it. 
if you stayed with the low fat or the high fat diet, you did better than if you didn't. If you stayed with the low protein or high protein diet, you did better than if you didn't. But the protein content, the fat content, and the carbohydrate content did not make any distinguishable difference. So it was a very clear endpoint. Now, how is that being received? Is that controversial? Um, it's, uh, the basic message ha is, uh, has been now taken into the new dietary advice for obese people. And the message is any diet will work. You just need to stay with it. So it's picking a diet that works for you. Maybe one more trial, uh, the vitamin D to prevent type 2 diabetes study. Um, let's see, when did that trial uh, begin? Or it hasn't begun yet. Yes, it has. Oh, it hasn't. The, 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 uh, the question of whether vitamin D would prevent uh, the development of diabetes in people at risk, so pre-diabetes, the same population that we had in the diabetes prevention program. Um, was actually stimulated in part from the di diabetes prevention program. The group at Tufts, who were the major group running this trial, took samples from the diabetes prevention program, looked at the vitamin D levels in serum and whether they developed diabetes. And those with higher vitamin D levels in their serum developed less diabetes than those with lower levels. So the question was if you artificially modify the levels by giving vitamin D, could you reduce conversion to diabetes from people who uh, were uh, at risk? So that trial, planning for that trial began about three years ago. It was funded two years ago and actually began recruiting just about a year ago. So we're in the midst of a two-year recruiting uh, phase for the trial and uh, we're just, we're all, all uh, 20 centers are working very hard to recruit our 2,500 patients. But there won't be any outcomes from it until we finish, A, all the recruiting, and then two years after that. So if you want to talk to me in uh, 2017, I might be able to give you more information. Okay, I'd love to. Okay, over the course of your career, you've served as an editor and on numerous editorial boards of endocrine journals. You founded three journals, the International Journal of Obesity, Obesity Research, and Endocrine, pra Endocrine Practice. Would you comment on the importance of founding these journals for their respective fields? Uh, well, when we founded the International Journal of Obesity, there were no journals in our field, and it was part of building the platform. Um, when I went to the board uh, of counselors for the North American Association for the Study of Obesity, as it was called then, uh, in 1990 with my vision that we needed an, another journal reflecting North American contributions and to take up the growing number of papers that were being rejected from other journals. Um, they agreed and said, why didn't I go to it? So I did and put it together um, and began publishing in, in uh, 1993. And I edited it for five years. Um, it, uh, it gave me an opportunity to get a, a journal off the ground, which is always easier than taking a big one when you gotta read all those papers. And one of the things we included in it were historical pieces about classics and obesity. So I picked 30 papers that I viewed to be classics in obesity research from the past, publish those along with a short commentary about them as part of the content of these first five uh, issues. Uh, in the midst of this, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists were organizing themselves uh, and asked me if I would be on their board and put me on their committee to form a new journal. Since I already done two journals, that seemed not an inappropriate place for me to be. Um, and I, there were several publishers who were very eager to take on publishing the journal, and, and why wouldn't you? Because it was a direct channel to the practicing endocrinology group. Um, and I realized that this would be a terrible mistake for the association, that they ought to do their own journal, which they owned and, and controlled. And so after a good bit of work and the fact that I'd already 
founded two journals, they were willing to let me found and edit this one for the first year. Since I was already doing two journals at the same time, I didn't really want to uh, do a, a, another one for very long. But as part of what I did for the, uh, f that journal was ask Clark Sawin, who's the man at the Endocrine Society who's taken this interest in history of oral history of medicine, uh, if he would write a, a couple of historical pieces for us, which he did. Uh, and uh, I had met Clark uh, when I was a fellow in Dr. Astwood's laboratory at the beginning of my career. He was in the next cubicle set, and I, so I got to know Clark then and known him personally until he got his final illness. Um, and he had always had an interest in the, the, the broadest side of endocrinology. He, he probably knew too much to get focused down as you have to do for some research aspects, but from the society's perspective and from the historical perspective, he made an enormous contribution. And for this endocrine practice journal, he actually contributed history to that as well. So I, I'm grateful to him uh, for that as well as our friendship for all those earlier years. But that was part of what we used to fill a journal. Until you get those early papers, you've got to get something in the journal. And so it was, it was good to take things of that kind which were of interest to endocrinologists uh, and that would be enduring because history doesn't go away. And uh, so that's how we got three journals in and out the door. And I'm happy to have finished all three of them. Uh, as far as the Obesity Society goes, you're founder and counselor, president. Um, what is the mission and the vision of the Obesity Society? Well, the, the Obesity Society came about to provide a research platform f for investigators interested in, in the research side, not necessarily the practice side of, of obesity. It's, it's much like the Endocrine Society, which was put together to bring the endocrinologists together who were doing research in the field to have a platform and a, and a venue for their A, publications and B, research presentations. And the, the pattern for the Obesity Society, as I put it together back in the 1980s, was basically the same. It was to provide an annual meeting forum, eventually a journal, uh, the things that an academic society has that make it the place you want to present your research that brings people who have a common interest uh, together on an annual basis to talk about the things that make their eyes light up. Who were your collaborators in putting that together, your main ones? Uh, in putting the obesity society yeah. together? Well, I was the major one. Um, I sort of did it myself. That was oh, out of Alan my... Alan Howard wasn't involved? In no, Alan Howard had already done the one in England. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, we... We looked in our crystal ball about doing that, but after the meeting um, where John Brunzel suggested I do it, I went out and did it. Um, and then we had to get all the rest of the machinery in order over the years. So to have an annual meeting, you have to do a lot of things. And since we were having um, international meetings periodically as well, we didn't want to compete with those, so we only met um, initially in years when there were no international meetings, uh, like this meeting in Chicago is a meeting with the International Endocrine so Society and the American Endocrine Society. That's now what we're doing with our nationals. We're always having a, a, an obesity society meeting, even if there's an international meeting. What are your current views of the field? Uh, and I'll it could be endocrinology in general, or it could be just obesity. Well, I think, uh, I think obesity, like many other areas, once part of endocrinology, but as the numbers of people grow, subspecialty groups appear. I mean, the calcium people appear, and the reproductive endocrinologists, and the, you know, that's sort of been the story of, of endocrinology. Uh, it's actually the story of obesity as well. It's not just obesity, it's the behavioral people, and the genetics people, and the and the clinical people. So it's always these specialties and it's an interface business that, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, I think the, the, the rise in the prevalence of obesity in the last 30 years has provided a stimulus to the field that wasn't there before. It's obviously a national health problem. 30% of our people are obese by usual criteria and another 30% are overweight. So, and we know that it has major impacts on, on health on longevity, uh, on healthcare costs. So we have to do something about it or we'll 
bankrupt the kid. Okay, thank you. My pleasure.